Right, in the last video, we couched or recouched the wave function in terms of not just a single particle wave function, but using that to define, to describe a flux of particles, a flow of particles, a current of particles. We define probability current, also aka flux. What we're going to do now is take that particle flux and have it incident on different types of variation of potential or to use a term that's used widely throughout not just quantum mechanics but condensed matter physics condensed matter chemistry quantum chemistry etc potential energy landscape potential landscape and we're going to think of two key uh landscapes first of all a step and then in the next video we're going to think about a barrier which looks like that so we're going to think about particles incident on a potential step, first of all. So we have a flux, incident flux. Uh, well, first of all, let's put some energies on here. So this is V0. Is that on the board? Let me just tilt it down that way a little bit. Yeah, that's okay. Um, and we're going to start with a case where the energy of our incoming particles is there. So here we've got that amount of kinetic energy and here we've got that amount of kinetic energy. Um, and this is our x-axis. Well, again just thinking one dimensionally so we have a incoming beam of particles, incoming flow of particles. Now, classically, if their energy is up here, they're just going to basically cross this step. Once they're on the other side of the, the, the step, the kinetic energy is going to be less because here, that's the kinetic energy. Here, that's the kinetic energy. Classically, they all get across the barrier. Remarkably, quantum mechanically, due to the wave-like characteristics that we have to consider and that we've considered at length throughout this uh, module thus far, those uh, wave-like characteristics mean that even in this case, when the energy of the particles is greater than the step height, some get reflected. And we're going to look at that um, in, in mathematical detail. Actually, I'm going to give you the steps, but you're going to do the algebra. You'll learn a lot more if you do the algebra yourself. I'll put the steps in, I'll guide you in the right direction, but you need to do the algebra, so you need to do some work. So we've got... Flow of particles going in, a beam of particles going in. Some of that beam quantum mechanically is going to be reflected, and some of it's going to be transmitted. And we're going to spend time deriving what are called the transmission and the reflection coefficients. So what the transmission and reflection coefficients are, are basically the ratio of the amount that's transmitted compared to the amount that's incident, and the amount that's um, reflected compared to the amount that's incident. And that we can quantify in terms of two key coefficients, T and R, transmission coefficient and reflection coefficient. And we're going to work through and see that. So, remember from the last video that if we've got, uh, we're now considering the wave function in terms of using that to describe a flow of particles, where for wave function is described like that, where again, I stress, we've got a unique wave number. It's not a unique spatial frequency. It's not like a, the case with the wave packet where we've got a range of different spatial frequencies. We've got a unique spatial frequency. That means we've got one well-defined, completely defined energy. And remember that we said that our flux, J, was given by this, which this represents now our number of particles per unit length. Um, and the velocity will be h bar k over m. So that's our flux. And what we want to do is look at, for each of these, for each of these beams, as it were, the incoming beam, the outgoing beam, and the transmitted beam, we want to look at the flux in each case. Okay, so I've just shifted the axis back a little bit. Can you see? Yeah, yeah I think you can. Just do that. Just shifted the axis back here. So just to give myself a little bit more room. So what we're going to do as well is we're going to define region one and region two.
The other thing as well, I'll just note in passing, so perhaps should have mentioned, is that the potential changes instantaneously here. So a potential Vx is defined zero for x less than zero, and V0 a constant for x greater than or equal to zero. That means it changes instantaneously. Think about what that means in terms of the force. So what, yet again, like delta functions, plane waves, completely frictionless surfaces, spherical cows, we're back in the land of idealizations, but it's all those idealis all those idealizations are important because they allow us to really cut to the core of the of the key physics. Okay. So we have region one, region two. Region one is defined. This is region one, let's do it like this, and this is region two. And in region one, we've got incoming beam, which we describe as e to the i k1 x. Oh, e to the i k1 x. And we've got an outcoming beam, which we'll describe as b to the e minus i k1 x. And in this region, different wave vector, because the energy is different here now. So C, E, and it's going this way. So C, E to the I, K, 2X. Let me shift that up, move it along here. Right, so one of those wave numbers, one of those spatial frequencies. So um, here, we're going to have E is equal to H bar squared, K1 squared over 2M implies k1 is equal to square root 2me over h bar and here we have k2 is equal to root or what's it going to be here 2me minus v0 um, over h bar over h bar So those are our wave numbers of spatial frequency in this region and this region. And again, classically, they all travel across here. Nothing's reflected once they cross this step. Whereas quantum mechanically, we're going to see that there's a reflected flux. Okay, so those are our wave numbers or spatial frequencies in those two regions. Let's also think about the flux in those two regions. So our incident flux is going to be, well, h bar um, k1 over m. Our reflective flux, so grf, is equal to, well, it's going to be this. And again, it's also going to be um, k1, but it's going to be negative because beam of particles is traveling in the other direction. So our velocity is in the other direction, hence minus h bar k1 over m. And this we call transmitted. And that's going to be uh, h bar k2 over m. Okay, so our wave functions, well, we've already got them down there, but let's be explicit. So a wave function in region 1 is a e to the i k x plus b e to the minus, sorry, i k 1 x minus i k 1 x. That's a minus, and that's just a bit of an i. So e to the positive i k 1 x plus b e to the negative minus i k 1 x. And then in region 2, we have, well, just as it's given there. We can define a reflection coefficient, R, in terms of a reflected, which is going to be this, uh, HRK1 over M, divided by our incident flux. Actually, the absolute value of that. This is in terms, because this is going to be a positive value minus h k over m. 
So just this is the absolute value because the, the, the reflection coefficient is a positive value. Here, because our particles are moving in this direction, we've got the flux is negative, but we don't care about the direction of the particles. We care about the, um, the flux, the magnitude of the flux. Hence, we're just getting the, the, the magnitude of this ratio, which in turn means that our reflection coefficient is the modulus of b squared over a squared. That's our reflection coefficient. Right, let's get rid of this. By the same logic, our transmission coefficient, where's my chalk go? There it is. Transmission coefficient is going to be, well, what's our transmitted flux? Our transmitted flux is this, uh, h bar q2 over m, uh, over our incident flux, which is this. So what we have is now our k's are not going to cancel out, so we're going to have Right, so the next step is we don't know those B's and A's. So we need to define those B's and A's on more pertinently. We need to define the ratio B over A and C over A. How do we do that? Right, so we do, when you looked at this last year in from Newton to Einstein, so go back, take a look at those. I keep referring to MRM 8 to MRM 16, and I believe it's chapters 38 to 42 of night. Go back, I'm building on that foundation. And you did something very, very similar last year. So what you do is you match. What we're going to do is we're going to match. Remember, this is x is equal to zero at this point. We're going to match the wave function at this point. So at x equal to zero. But we're also going to match the first derivative of the wave function at x equal to zero. Because the wave, fun the wave function has to be continuous. And the first derivative of the wave function has to be continuous. Make sure you can do that. Follow through the steps. And the answers you'll get. Just let me clean the board and I'll put them up there. And I'll stress again. It came up in the questionnaires when we talked, the module questionnaires, the responses to the module questionnaires, and we also talked about it in, in the most recent synchronous session. Um, you, some of you are saying you want more steps in the mathematics. This is just algebra. Honestly, this is nothing beyond to get to, um, from the matching conditions to get to this expression, is nothing beyond what you've done at A level. So work through the algebra it's it's not a good use of my time or your time to just watch me laboriously go through the algebra here because it's nothing beyond there are no surprises in there you just go through the algebra and find out that you can define b over a as this do that make sure you can do it and then in terms of c over a what we have is uh, 2k1 over k1 and that in turn means a reflection and reflection, sorry, and transmission coefficients are r is equal to and t is equal to. So make sure you can go through the algebra and pull out those reflection and transmission coefficients. And those are questions related to that are on worksheet seven. So let's rem remind ourselves of what K1 and K2 are. So K1 square root 2ME over H bar and K2 K2 is the square root of 2ME minus V naught over h bar. First of all, we've got a finite reflection, which we wouldn't have in the, the classical case. The other really, the other perhaps surprising thing as well is that if E minus, if E is equal to V0, so if the energy of the particles is equal to the step height, then this um, becomes zero. And that means our transmission coefficient becomes zero. And that means well, you can, this becomes zero. Well, if this is zero, T and R have got to add up to one. That's actually another expression of conservation of mass. We've got um, no particles are being created or destroyed. So the flux, the total, total amount of um, 
particles defined by those fluxes have to be conserved. Therefore, T plus R has to be equal to 1. So if T is, uh, T is equal to 0, R is equal to 1, and indeed you can just plug K2 is equal to 0 in here, K1 squared over K1 squared gives you 1. That means when E is equal to V0, absolutely everything is reflected. Let's look at it in terms of the wave function as well. That's x equal to zero there, so this is uh, x. Actually, no, let's look at it in terms of the probability density. So this is region one, and this is region two. And in region one, and our step is here, our potential step is here, but now we're looking at the probability density. So our wave function in this region So that means, if that's our wave function, then our probability density, psi 1 by its complex conjugate, make sure you do this, is a squared plus b squared, and then we're going to have a term, uh, do the cross terms here, 2ab cos, and it's going to be uh, 2k1x. Make sure you can see that. Make sure you can do that. Just take that, multiply it through by its complex conjugate, and you'll get an expression that looks like that. So that's what a wave function looks like in um, the uh, region one. So we're going to end up with a cos-like dependence in terms of the probability density, that side. And then on the other side, a wave function is c e to the i k 2 x implies our probability density is just going to be so what we effectively have is flat we've just got a constant for our probability density in this region so due to the the combination the ingoing wave and the reflected wave, we get this cost dependence. Here we've just got uh, um, just one term, and therefore we've got a flux whose uh, the number of particles per unit length stays constant, so that's just a constant of probability density. This side of the step is just a constant, simply because we've just got one plane wave there representing our flux. Hope that makes sense. Right, onwards and upwards or downwards, actually onwards and downwards, um, we're now going to consider the case where the energy of the particles is less than V0. Okay, now we're considering this situation where our energy landscape stays the same, potential energy landscape stays the same. This is V0 again, so x equal to 0, but now the energy of our particles is E. So it's less than the height of the potential step. So classically, we can do a really simple demo here in terms of what's going on. Classically, we've got a particle incoming. Yeah. Classically, So classically, we've got our particle incoming, and it's always going to be reflected off that barrier. So classically, hits that potential wall, and it's reflected backwards. Quantum mechanically, as you know, that's not what happens. There's a finite probability for particles to be found the other side of the barrier, or in the wall, as it were. There is a probability density in this region, as we're about to see. There isn't a flux, however. So that's a subtle distinction. It's an important distinction, though. There is a probability density, but as we're going to see, there isn't a flux. So that means there is a, a potential, there is a, let's choose our words with care, there is a pro finite probability to find particles in this region, but there isn't a transmitted current of particles. So in terms of region one, and region two again. 
Region 1's exactly the same as the last situation. In going beam, out going beam. This is going to be A E to the I K1 X. This is going to be B E to the I, uh, sorry, minus I K1 X going in the opposite direction. On this side, we've got to be careful. Something very interesting happens on this side. So, what we have is for this side, let me just get rid of region two. We know it's region two, maybe put it down here. What's our wave number in this region? Well, square root two m e minus v naught over h bar. And our solution remains the same, c e to the i k two x. But now we've got a very interesting effect happening. Put a bracket on there. E, e is less than V0. E is less than V0. Just tilt that around a little bit. Which means that what's in the, under the square root sign here becomes negative. So that means we've effectively, not effectively, that means we've got an imaginary wave number in that region. So we can rewrite that as, oh, let me just free up a bit of room here, this is. So we can rewrite that in terms of i is going to be i So what I've done there is pull the square root of minus one out. So that changes this e to the minus v zero into a v zero minus e, flipped it round. And now what we can do is we can write our k2 as we've got this imaginary number. Let me just shift this for a second. And let's write it with a little dash, like I do in the notes, just like that. That doesn't mean a derivative or anything like that. It's just to distinguish this k2, which is this, from this. Why am I doing that? Well, there's a very important reason. So th this, th this idea of imaginary wave number, imaginary spatial frequency, is not restricted to quantum. Again, this is not some bizarre, strange quantum effect that has no analog in the real, no analog in the real world, no analog in the classical world. It does. Tunneling is often, and I've done this myself, is put across as this, you know, incredibly purely quantum effect that has absolutely no connection with classical physics. That's not true. You're going to, um, in wave phenomena, you're going to come across the concept of an effinescent wave. So a, a wave, an electromagnetic field that doesn't propagate in free space, but exponentially decays off. And so if we think about fiber optics, you think about how fiber optics work, you've got total internal reflection. Actually, the propagating wave gets reflected, so it travels down. But right at the surface there, there's a decaying um wave that doesn't propagate but there's still an amplitude for that wave and it's called the effinescent field you'll see more of that in wave phenomena but the the important thing here is that we've got an imaginary wave number because of this uh, energy difference because now our e is less than v0 means we end up with an imaginary um wave number okay so we've got k2 is equal to i k2 dash where k2 dash remember is this square root of 2 um, uh, v naught minus e over h bar. Here's where it gets very important though. So um, in that region, a wave function, c e to the minus, uh, sorry, c e to the i plus i k2 x, which is equal to c e to the i, We've got this now for k2 i 
here to prime x. Now, this is, so what we have is ce to the minus k2 prime x. That's our wave function on the other side of the step for the case where e is less than v0. Notice, this is crucial to notice, not just in terms of quantum, but in terms of classical fields as well. What we have, it seems like a trivial mathematical thing, but it's very important. What we have now is this is real, right? This is this, this is positive. So this, this quantity is, is, is real. Um, and this means that what we have is a real wave function. No, there is no i in here. There's no i in the exponent, which means this isn't oscillating. It's not cos kx. It's not cos k2x plus i sine two, two, uh, k2x. It's not an oscillatory solution. It's an exponentially decaying solution because the exponent is real. So let's. What does that mean in terms of our wave function? Well, it means a wave function in region one is as we described uh, in the last case, or probability density, let's do it for consistency for, uh, um, for consistency with, oh, that's a terrible line. For consistency with the last case, um, we've got our exponentially decaying, So region one, region two. So what we have in this region is the a squared plus b squared plus two a b cos two k one x solution we had for last time because we got incoming and outgoing flux. But here, what we have is not a flat flux being transmitted, so a, a constant probability density. We have an exponentially decaying off probability density. Because our wave function, e to the minus uh, k2 prime x, which means that our probability density uh, this is a real function, so we basically just square it, it's going to be minus 2 kappa 2 prime x. Okay? So exponentially decaying wave function, square that, so exponentially decaying probability density, but no flux. Okay, so it's, this, is, this is exponentially decaying off. We don't have a flux of particles through. We have a probability for finding particles, but we don't have a current of particles that side of the step. Given that we don't have a flux, given that we don't have a current on the other side of the step, what does that mean for our reflection and transmission coefficients? Well, what it means is that there is no flux of particles the other side of that step. An exponentially decaying pro probability density, but there's no flux. Therefore, our reflection coefficient is 1. And I ask you in the notes, so remember that our reflection coefficient is given by this. And I ask you in the notes and on the worksheet on worksheet 7 to show that R is equal to uh, k1 squared plus k2 prime squared over k1 squared plus k2 prime squared is equal to 1. So work through. Again, the algebra is well within your grasp. Work through the algebra. Um, you're going to do the same approach in terms of matching the wave function um, and matching the first derivative of the wave function to pull out what the values of, of B and A are. Square those, ratio those, and you'll find that what you get is that. And that, of course, that divided by the same thing gives us 1. So the other way of seeing this is to write down what we saw in the last video, the probability flux, probability current, which is going to be minus h bar over 2m. Uh, complex conjugate of the wave function in, in region 2 uh, multiplied by this derivative minus um, times, and that's the complex conjugate. So probability flux, that tells us the, the current of particles. 
But this is this is key because side two because this is purely real then what we have is we can get rid of the complex conjugate sign here because the complex conjugate of a purely real function is that real function gives us that that is the same as that so that is equal to zero we have no current we have no flow of particles in that region instead which is why it's all consistent that means a reflection coefficient is equal to one because nothing's getting transmitted but, and I know this is perhaps counterintuitive, we still have a probability density in terms of finding particles due to that exponentially decaying of um, probability density. But there's no net flow of particles through, through into that region. Okay, we're going to extend, in the next video, we're going to extend that idea of the um, exponential decay of the probability density to consider not a potential step, but to consider a potential barrier. And that brings us into the wonderful realms of the scanning tunneling microscope. And on the subject of the scanning tunneling microscope, there is this beautiful image that's on the screen right now, which is just a staggering image taken by um, Don Eigler's group. So particularly a guy called Mike Cromie um, back in the 90s. Uh, Mike Cromie was also responsible for, and Eigler's group was also responsible for the quantum corral image that I bang on about at length, that wonderful circular image where you can see the ripples um, the, of the electron density, the probability density within, within the ring. But this is another uh, image from that group. And look, you can see the ripples. You can see the waves of the electron density as it's scattered at those steps. So those are, those are atomic steps. So at any surface, you have layers of atoms, you have terraces of atoms, we call them. And then the, a very common defect is a step, is an atomic step. But look at those ripples. You know, this the video opens up with that quote from um, Heisenberg about potentialities and mathematics and that we can't ever visualize this. We can visualize this quantum world. We can see these waves. I'm very much, we're going to do matrix mechanics very soon. For those of you itching to get into Dirac notation and a bit more mathematical um, abstraction, let's put it that way. We'll do that soon. But I'm a scanning probe microscopist. I'm a scanning tunneling microscopist. I see those waves in front of me all the time, and therefore I'm a wave mechanics person, which is why there was so much emphasis on Fourier uh, analysis throughout this. To me, that makes sense of the quantum world when we think about the, the wave aspects. But you can see, look, it's not a question of it being all mathematical abstraction. We can measure this. We can see those ripples. We can see that probability density. We can see those waves. And... Um, in the next video, we're going to extend that further and we're actually going to do a, uh, an experiment down in the lab and uh, look at tunnel currents flowing. Okay, see you then.